been a great ride as an open champ. The jug, the champion can keep for a year, travel around the world, keep it nice and clean and shiny as you can see. <laughs> Merrifield means so much. You know, in 1992, I finished fifth here behind Nick Faldo. And that fifth place got me into the Masters and the US Open, got me onto the money list. So Merrifield is where things really started for me back in 92. So it's an honor to bring it back with uh, a bit of sadness. <laughs> Open champions at Muirfield stand out. Their stature reflects the quality of the course. Jack Nicklaus captured his first Open here. Lee Trevino, Tom Watson, and Nick Faldo also triumphed. Each multiple winners of golf's ultimate test. There are certain events that define a player's career and his place in history. It's life-changing for those who succeed, but it can be life-changing for those who almost succeed and fall away. The Open produces ecstasy and heartbreak. Majors define players' careers. They're what we all measure ourselves off, I guess, at the end of the day. Lytham was the first time I really showed myself that I could win the Open. So Muirfield was always going to be exciting for me. And for the man who beat him, the overriding emotion was pride. To me, it has always been the most special one. When you're an Open champion, um, that's a very, very special time in your life. But nothing is ever guaranteed at the Open. You have to be at the top of your game, and Els was in trouble from the start. Those are the kind of things I never did last year when I won. I made a very sloppy bogey and uh, ticked me off a little bit. That was not the way I wanted to start. On a day of low scoring, Els eventually shot 74 and was never in the hunt. But with weather more akin to southern Spain than East Lothian, Rafael Cabrera Bayo had a day to remember. The hard, fast-running turf suited the Spaniard down to the ground. Cabrera Bayo posted a 67, feeling very much at home. I don't know, you, just look, you only need to look straight up. I mean, we, we've grown up uh, playing with uh, sun, good weather, a little, a little breeze as well, so this, this actually felt like, like Spain. Cabrera's point was emphasized by a fellow countryman of more senior years, Miguel Ankel Jimenez, the architect of a 68. He was making Muirfield appear simpler than it was. But so too was Zach Johnson, who stood over a lengthy putt at the fifth. For the most part, you're just trying to get within a three-foot circle. And, uh, you know, it, it, it fortunately caught the hole. Johnson's eagle launched a spectacular run of golf. His round of 66 was the best of the day. That Thursday, I potted great. That's really what it boiled down to. I made some great putts. Johnson was impressive, but the biggest story of day one was created by a player at the opposite end of the leaderboard. 2013 had been a trial for Rory McIlroy, and out of form, he only endured more misery at Muirfield. 
as talented as he is, and it sounds so ironic to, to say about someone who's won two majors, but he really hasn't been tested in terms of, you know, having those, those down periods that all players have. And it is hard to watch because you know that he's got to be extremely frustrated, but it's also sort of a rite of passage, I think, to some extent, that you've got to look into the darkness and, and find your own way. And, and I think players respect that. As gifted as he is, and as much as he's proved he's there for the long haul, he's still a young man and it's still a hard game. And he hasn't had the trials and tribulations that many have. I'm definitely underthinking on the golf course. Maybe overthinking it off it. It's just not, yeah, I just can't put it all together mentally out there. Sometimes I feel like I'm walking around out there and I'm unconscious, like brain dead. You cannot help feeling for Rory. Um, the fact that he, if he's had a bad day, he will come out, he will speak to you. His honesty is fabulous. I, I can't really fathom it at the minute and it's hard to stand up here and tell you guys what's, what's really wrong. It's such a fine line at the top of the game. It's just like a tightrope. You're on or you're off. Thanks. And to some extent, Roy's fallen off the tightrope. McElroy missed the cut, but the fine line was trodden unerringly by his playing partner, Mickelson. Confident and well prepared, having prevailed on the links at Castle Stewart, he shot 69. I was more ready to play Thursday than I have been in the past, and I think winning the Scottish Open the week before was a big part of that. It gave me confidence playing Lynx golf. It also gave me confidence in my own game that I was playing well. And when I teed off on Thursday, my game was sharp. I was ready to play. The leaderboard was packed with Americans, including 1998 champion Mark O'Meara. Propelled by an eagle on the 17th, the 56-year-old ended the day four under. But it was his great friend who, as usual, was center stage. On a tee from USA, Tiger Woods. There was a real stadium atmosphere, I think, about the first tee, with crowds banked up on either side and, and the backdrop behind the players. It's like gladiators coming out into the arena, isn't it? It has, it has quite an effect. But not for the first time at a major. Tiger's first shot went radically offline. It's extraordinary, actually, and I think when you stand watching Tiger on that first tee, you don't know what you're going to get. In major championships, he looks a little less, well, he looks fragile compared to, to what he was in his absolute prime. But Tiger's initial mistake soon gave way to customary excellence. After picking up shots on the 10th and 11th, he scrambled for par on the 12th. Before trying to charm a snaking putt on the 13th. He wasn't leading. But I think in a lot of people's mind, because he'd gotten off to a good start, the real leader was Tiger after the first round. In reality, with his 69, Woods was all square with Mickelson, three off the pace set by Zach Johnson. Yet more sunshine was expected as day two of the championship dawned. No rain, meant the advantage of power was diluted. The hard, fast conditions that we have do tend to take length out of the equation, and so it comes down to accuracy and, and short game and experience. I think the older players rub their hands in glee at the thought of an open championship. They don't have to hit the ball as far, but they have to be very, very strong mentally, and they have to know how to plot their way around the course. On the Lynx course, there are probably three or four ways for playing each shot, and choosing the right one is what really matters. And the older players just have that experience in spades. Lying joint second overnight, Marco Mira's knowledge was stretched to the limit. 
His first birdie didn't arrive until the 12th. He shot 78 to drop off the leaderboard and was replaced by 40-year-old Lee Westwood. The morning round that you have in the first two days is obviously your scoring opportunity. So, you know, I wanted to get out quickly and uh, make a few birdies early on, and I managed to birdie the first from about 25 feet. The golf course is a little bit more receptive, and the wind tends not to blow and pick up until lunchtime. Birdie the second from 15 feet. So that was the ideal start, really, uh, and then just kept building on that. With five birdies, Westwood covered the front nine in 31. Pushed on not only by a burning ambition, but the wave of support he received. You know, any time we're playing in Britain, you can really get a boost from the crowd and their energy and, and feed off it and try and use that as a, as a massive bonus. Um, you know, every time I made a putt or made a birdie, you know, there was a massive cheer. Just a shame, you know, we don't play in Britain a little bit more often. <laughs> His round of 68 would remain the lowest score of the day. Muirfield's 18th was unforgiving, but Henrik Stenson had the chance to excite the crowd. Instead, his putt never threatened as he closed the day two under. Solid, but unspectacular. There is, a, I think, an extra tension on 18 for most players. It used to be said of Jack Nicklaus, no matter how he played, he always birdied 18. It's an important way to finish the day, uh, to bring momentum or a lack of momentum to the next day. Don't leave the golf course with a bad feeling. You know, impress these people, impress your competitors. A lot of reasons to do it. And so I think great players tend to finish off their rounds better than other players. It wasn't always smooth, but Tiger's 71 ended perfectly. And that's why that, that birdie that, that Tiger made on 18 on Friday seemed to be, you know, a signal that he's got something special going into this weekend. By early afternoon, temperatures had soared into the low 80s on one of Scotland's hottest days of the year. As the sun beat down relentlessly, Jimenez took on Muirfield's most fearsome hold. Stop, stop. The 15th. Stop. stop. That flag in the 15th is unbelievable. It's impossible to, to let, give, give it the ball there. The, the, that flag on the back, on the right, with a downwind, down grain, and uh, down the slope, the bunker there. It's, it's impossible to stop the ball there. Impossible. But as Jimenez showed, not impossible to escape with a par. Game of golf, you know, and especially in these conditions, you know, is uh, like I always say, the more important thing probably is not to make many birdies, but the main, main thing is not to make many bogeys. True to his word, Jimenez parred the last four holes to stay three under for the championship. It would prove a difficult score to match. For the veteran, a satisfying experience especially with his family on hand to share the moment. <laughs> Playing the more important tournament in the world. Playing the, with the more important people in your side. You don't need anything more, really, no? <laughs> By six o'clock, the course, sun-baked and bone-dry, was on the limit. As green staff dampened down the rock-hard fairways, Former Masters champion Zach Johnson reached the 15th, a hole that had already wrecked many cards. I would have liked to have known that there was a lot of so-called carnage on that hole prior to it. He was four under and leading, but didn't appreciate the full extent of what lay ahead. It looks like it landed on concrete. I essentially hit a wedge about 180. Put myself in a pretty difficult predicament and I hit probably one of the best pitches that I hit all week, actually. I mean, just to get it somewhat near the pin. A very difficult putt. I mean, I knew that going into it, it looked fast, and it was fast. Breaking kind of into the wind, um, so I tried to play the wind. You know, I hit a great putt, and it just missed on the right side of the hole.
Unable to judge the elements, he made a double bogey. Those four footers are really key in the open. And it doesn't matter if they're for birdie, par, or bogey. You, you mean, those, those are important putts. And um, that, uh, that took a little one out of my sail. On the 16th, the same fate befell Mickelson. The biggest challenge in putting on Lynx Golf is a direct crosswind. The wind can take it, especially when it's going the same way as the break. And so it was a putt that would be almost a straight putt, maybe slight break, that I'm playing on the edge and afraid that it won't break and it breaks across the hole, and it happened twice. But that did not affect my confidence in how I was putting. And even though I gave a couple back on one hole coming in, I thought that that round was the round that, that kept me in it heading into the weekend. Unfazed, Mickelson safely parred the last two holes to stay in touch with one over. Dustin Johnson was also in the reckoning one of only nine players under par at the end of a brutal day on the parched links. Tiger had a platform to break his major championship drought, while Mickelson was for a drift of the leader, Himeneth. Some golfers are successful, others are popular. The leader going into the third round of the Open Championship is both. People love to see a person who's, you know, a nonconformist and totally at peace with it. You know, the stretching routine is bizarre, but there's a coolness about him because he's so himself. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a freedom and a liberation there that I think we all would like to have in our own lives, and it's so hard to attain, but he has it. The Spaniard's unique pre-round loosening ritual is now a familiar sight on ranges around the world. <laughs> it makes me feel unwell to watch it, quite honestly. And uh, gosh, what flexibility. Joining Jimenez in the final pairing was an admiring Henrik Stenson. He's a crowd pleaser. I mean, the, the crowds really like him, and, and he's very solid tee to green. He keeps, uh, keeps his shots under control. On the demanding first hole, he did just that, making a stress-free par. He plays a good game. I mean, he's, he's not a puppy anymore either. But Stenson would stumble, a victim of nerves. Uh, I mean, I was, I was just trying to enjoy the, the experience as much as playing well, you know? I think it was, I was definitely a little tense in the beginning, and then after the start, I, uh, you know, dropping a couple early on, then, then I kind of got back into, into the rhythm. But on Saturday, there was no doubting which group was the center of attention. It featured the world number one playing alongside the home favorite. Obviously, there's a lot more people watching, but um, I, I got on well with Tiger, so we just, it's quite relaxing. You know, we, we had quite an enjoyable day, I think. We both played pretty well. When Tiger birded the second and Westwood bogeyed the third, the American led the championship. The pattern for a day of continuous shifts in fortune had been set. On the fourth, neither player found the green. Westwood escaped from heavy rough to give himself a chance for par. But the part of Woods was lengthier. After Tiger's first bogey of the day, Westwood's putting technique, recently and subtly changed by Ian Baker Finch, the 1991 champion, was put to the test. There were times when watching Lee putt prior, prior to Mifflin, it looked like he was strangling the club, literally holding it so tight. Ian Baker Finch got him to just relax himself a lot more. His arms seemed to swing a lot more loose from his body. Everything just suddenly looked good. You like to see putts going in and you like to be making putts. You know, not just for the case of making birdies, but also keep, you know, those par putts, keeping momentum going. Boldly, using his driver twice, Westwood almost reached the green on the par 5 fifth. 
again. Come on. Come on. Tiger also decided to attack. A gamble that came agonizingly close to paying off. And a Grieve Woods could only manage a par. Westwood, though, had a higher goal. It was a fairly obvious one with the, with the big ridge just right at the hole. So I thought, I'll just feed it out 15 feet right there, and it should just gather up towards the hole. As I hit the putt, my caddy Mike walked out to the right hand side, and normally when caddies do that, it means it's online. <laughs> it was for a thrilling Eagle Three. Well, that, that, that was probably the loudest cheer I heard all week. If it was, the second loudest came when Westwood birded the seventh. Four holes after trailing Tiger, he now led the championship by three. While Westwood prospered, Jimenez made three early bogeys, and it could have been worse but for a miraculous escape on the fourth. I put my, my recovery leg away from the bunker there, make some kind of a contortionist there. And then I was making a, a nice shot. I got a picture somewhere at home already. Yeah, it's nice. Par was saved, but the 49 year old had begun to slip off the pace. Having been in command, Westwood also ran into trouble. Back-to-back -back bogeys, together with Tiger's birdie on the ninth, meant they were all square again. Yeah! On a day when scores in the 60s were scarce, Hunter Mayhem made significant strides, with a 68 to be one under and in contention. The round of Mickelson was fueled more by grit than genius. The high point, his birdie on the 12th. 12 was really the last good birdie opportunity coming in, and so I felt like that was a necessary birdie because the remaining six holes were so tough. Mickelson's assessment was more accurate than his tee shot on the 13th. It led to one of three late bogeys and a disappointing 72. That finish on Saturday could have been a blessing in disguise because I think it made him that much more determined heading into the last round because I don't believe he finished the round the way he wanted to. Last year's runner-up did. Under the radar for most of the week, Adam Scott climbed the leaderboard with a 70. Possible redemption beckoned. The Tiger-Westwood match again came to the boil on a crucial stretch. At two under, Woods was eyeing a birdie on the 16th. And when Westwood's tee shot found tall grass, it was very much advantage Tiger. Westwood's second only deepened the crisis. Well, it went up the bank and it rolled around to the right uh, and up against the collar um, and left me in a tough spot. Mm -hmm. As I stood here, I just thought it was an easy way to catch the distance. On 16, you know, Lee was in a position to perhaps lose the championship, make a big number because the ball could have gone anywhere from where he was and it was a very difficult shot that could have kept rolling back to him. It's not getting it's rolling over. Yeah. yeah. I decided in the end to put it. Uh, it was a difficult putt. And it's bounced as well before it got on the green, so you know it took a bit of pace off it. With his rival staring at a double bogey, Tiger looked set to pounce. Countless key putts have obeyed his wishes, but this one taunted Woods and gave a newly confident Westwood further encouragement.
The putting had changed everything in, in Lee's attitude. He, he, he believed now that if he was in trouble, he, he didn't have to worry about the putting because the putter was looking after itself. It felt like a par at the time almost. It was one that I could keep the momentum going with. Pleased to get off the hole. The allegiance of the crowd was split, and so was the 17th fairway by Tiger's tee shot. But then came a cardinal error. The dreaded cross bunkers intervened. Tiger was fully aware of the consequences. What had been a quest for a birdie was transformed into a bogey. With his son, Sam, watching, Westwood's third was much more straightforward. When you can hear everybody shouting, come on Lee, come on Lee, come on Westy, come on Lee. And then a year voice shout, come on dad, like that. It sort of makes your mind sort of spring into action. Inspired by Westwood Junior, Westwood Senior birded. He's obviously a, a lucky charm, so I had to get him to come out more often, I think. Now the Englishman was destined to be third round leader. I'd say that was probably his best putting performance in a major, and it made me feel like maybe this is his week. He's got something just that little extra. The weapon that he never has, which is the putter, under pressure, making unlikely putts, and sending a signal to the, to the field that he's not gonna give it back. Maybe Tiger wouldn't agree, but what a super Saturday it had been. Woods trail by two, Mickelson by five as Westwood led the Open. His elusive breakthrough win in a major tantalizingly close. The final day of the 2013 Open Championship, and the leader was up and about early. Yeah, to be woken up by Ivor Robson every morning when he announces the first tee time, it's quite unusual. <laughs> staying right by the first tee, so... Uh... Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lovely house we were staying in and, and very convenient. I didn't use the locker room all week. On the from Sweden, Henrik Stenson. While Westwood had convenience, Stenson drew from the experience of a twice open champion at Muirfield. I was staying with Faldo for the week and uh, we had a chat on the Sunday morning over breakfast. You know, he talked about some of the nice parts that he made and, you know, I made probably a 45 foot part down the first, straight in the middle, boom. And I thought when I made that one, all right, here we go. That's, that's what he was talking about over breakfast. Another birdie arrived on the third, and the Swede found himself just two shots off the lead. It was a great start, and, and I was really right up in the mix there. Before the last group went out, the silver medal for leading amateur was convincingly won by Matthew Fitzpatrick who beat Jimmy Mullen by five shots. The teenager from Sheffield enjoyed a day he will never forget. An established star was hoping for the same. Expectation was immense, but the home favorite refused to be burdened. It's not really diff any different from leading any other tournament. You know, he's still the, the 54 old leader and it's a 72 old competition, there's a long way to go. Yeah. The final day's all in the mind, you know, getting comfortable and getting off to a good start. A lot of it's waged in the mind. Ran the one at the first, close for birdie. Oh, I was pleased with the way where this thing started. The same could not be said of Westwood's playing partner, Hunter Mahan. He bogeyed the second and fell three adrift. A drop shot on the third meant Ian Poulter was nine shots behind. But his renowned tenacity then shone through. I obviously birded five. I eagled nine, which fires me up, which gets me on a roll. So now all of a sudden, you know, I'm not nine back, I'm six back. 
all of a sudden things can change pretty quickly. You know, a fantastic 35 foot putt on 10 from off the front of the green with another grandstand right behind that green. They fire me up, I get fired up, hold a lovely 15 footer on the next. I've got, you know, a huge stand to my right hand side as I hold my putt up. They go crazy. You know, things are starting to happen now. I'm, I'm putting myself in a, in a really nice position. I hit seven iron off of uh, the 12th tee, which went an enormous distance down that hole. Left myself a sand iron, I hit it to 15 feet, and again, there's another grandstand. I hold that putt from 15 feet, they go nuts, I go nuts. Poulter was transformed. Out of the pack, a genuine contender had emerged. At that point right there, I felt that, you know, I was right in this golf tournament and I've got a great chance to win. In marked contrast, Tiger's game wasn't in sync. Struggling from the outset, the world number one was guilty of three damaging early bogeys. Yet while his great rival was toiling, Phil Mickelson's vibe was positive. I had a great feeling Sunday. And when I birdied five, all I was trying to do was par six, seven, and eight, because if I could get to nine, I could birdie there and get to even for the tournament, which is what I did. On the 10th, though, Mickelson made his first mistake of the day. The result of five, and a degree of momentum surrendered. And that was a tough bogey because I had gotten to that score that I wanted, and the very next hole I come back and, and lose it with a bogey. Westwood encountered trouble on the third, but two holes later came the chance to strike back. His birdie inspired the loudest cheer of the day so far. Leading by three, his elusive first major appeared a little closer. Tiger was becoming detached, but Poulter and Stenson were a threatening presence. Even more so when Stenson birded the ninth. That was the one time I felt like, okay, I gotta make this one, and, and I really did. And then I, I, I kind of looked up at the boards and saw that I was in, in pretty close contact walking down 10. Had a great shot in there and left myself an eight footer for, for birdie. And uh, unfortunately, the putt lipped out. And it's one of those key moments, you know, who, who knows if it would have looked different if I would have made that one on 10. Stenson remained one under. Adam Scott suffered a poor start until his round ignited with a string of birdies from the seventh. I wasn't really where I wanted to be. Good things would have to happen to get in with a chance. I didn't feel that was a turning point, but I think the one at eight was a bit of a bonus. To roll that putt in across the green then gave me the sense of, okay, this can happen now. Nine is obviously a great opportunity for birdie. You know, I got very conservative with a putt for eagle, but I felt like, you know, I didn't have to be a hero on the ninth. I, yeah, it was a putt that could run away from you, and, uh, you know, to finish the front nine and turn under par was a big difference than turning an over par. As those chasing found their range, pressure mounted on Westwood who woefully misjudged his tee shot on the seventh. Uh, well, we sort of stuck between clubs a little bit. I ended up trying it a big nine, um, which was never enough club, as it, you know, in hindsight. The unravelling process had begun, and Westwood would also tangle with sand on the eighth.
Another shot dropped, and in the midst of a crisis. You know, I figured at some point during the final round, things were going to get testing. They normally do. Uh, it's not normally plain sailing. Um, but, you know, you just try and regroup then and, and get on with the job. Many of his pursuers had gained ground on the ninth, but Westwood's ball striking let him down. What an irony that one of the best long iron players should start to struggle with that part of his game when he needed it most. Why or how that happened, I can only really put that down to the pressure. As if to rub salt into his wounds, Westwood's playing partner, Hunter Mahan, hit an outstanding approach to the par five. The American made an eagle and turned level par for the championship. Emotion soared and crashed. Suddenly, three men were tied for the lead, and Mickelson, lurking just off the pace, was about to engage in brilliance on the dangerous 13th. It was a feast or famine hole, and that five iron I hit was the best shot I hit probably all week, which put even more pressure on the putt because I have the best opportunity now to get that shot back I lost on 10. So this was the putt that was going to make the round go either way. If that birdie on 13 felt important. Can't say enough for how huge that was momentum-wise for him when he made it. It put him psychologically in a great place. The American's mind was strong. His putter was hot and the temperature rose on the 14th. You have to make some of these putts at that distance. And some are tough when they're cross break and when they're downhill, but this one was uphill with very little break. This was one that I really needed to make too. Yeah, that was a big momentum builder there because it, it got me to under par. It, it got me to where I felt was going to be tied or, or in the lead. Having bogeyed the 12th, Stenson tried hard to avoid a repeat at the next. But a testing par putt remained. Back to back bogeys, and Stenson was faltering. A year on from the dejection of Royal Lytham, Adam Scott was elated when he birded the 11th to once again lead the Open on Sunday afternoon. I felt good after holding that putt and I saw that put me in the lead, but with seven holes to play, your mind's not running off thinking about a claret jug. <laughs> after his earlier brilliance, Poulter began to stall and could ill afford the bogey that reared its head on the 16th. Still, two holes after that setback, Poulter was warmly greeted on the 18th. One of the world's most popular players shot 67 to set the clubhouse target at one over. So you're going to keep yourself warm and loose now? It may be playoff time. Yeah, well, I'm not having a beer just yet, that is for <laughs> sure. Poulter had cause for optimism as pressure on the leaders intensified. Almost as soon as Scott hit the front, he began to buckle. Momentum is such a huge thing in the game, and looking back at it, I think the putt on 13 was crucial, and it was a tough putt to read. The 13th would be pivotal as he battled for par. I just misread it, and to drop a shot, the momentum really shifted there. The crowd, gathered around the par three, sensed another critical moment had arrived as Westwood stood on the tee. If 
Yeah, I mean, that's a tough hole. I ballooned it out to the right, found a tricky lie and ended up making bogey. The swing faults tend to come out when you're, when you're under pressure and you find yourself with a tricky shot. Westwood had fallen back to level par, one behind Scott and Mickelson. We knew that if you made a par, you were going to continue to be in really good shape. And if you happened to make something better than par, I mean, it was just like Christmas. Even without a driver in his bag, a pumped up Mickelson was hitting the ball an astounding distance. I was surprised that tee shot of 15 went so far. I mean, that five iron went 300. 30 yards, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it had gone that far. And I ended up having an L wedge into that pin. There was no third consecutive birdie, but on a day when pars were priceless, Mickelson wasn't complaining. Having stalled on the previous hole, Scott again made life difficult on the 14th falling victim to Muirfield's subtle defences. You've got to make putts to win big tournaments, and that one on 14, that first putt really tested me, and I, and I misjudged it. After his collapse at Lytham, Scott was in danger of enduring deja vu. Although he didn't know it, Mickelson was now the outright leader. But on the 16th, he had to brush aside momentary frustration. In Lynx golf, you're going to get bad breaks. And for a few seconds, I was really upset that the ball rolled back off the green down at a low spot. Then I, it kind of dawned on me that everybody's got to play this hole. And if I can make par, I'm probably going to pick up a shot he said to me, that's OK, I'm going to get this up and down in a very, very kind of calm and collected way. And I had no doubt that he would at that point. Mickelson, the ultimate short game maestro, knew that saving par would be crucial. But his chip was only half the task. The American kept the lead, but many retained hope, including Westwood, who, for the first time that day, was playing catch-up. He desperately needed a morale-boosting birdie, and opportunity came knocking on the 14th. The putt was weak. The moment had passed. And on the par 5 17th, Mickelson was about to produce the defining moment of the 2013 championship. I hit just this perfect low, driving, penetrating three with that had no spin on it, and just bored through the air, got on the ground, and ran. If Phil hit 1,000 balls, if you gave him 1,000 tee shots on that 17th hole, he would never hit one further than he hit that ball off the tee. And I had a slight uphill lie. This shot has to come off perfectly for me to have a chance at birdie, and it did. He hit two shots of a lifetime consecutively. That's where I started to sense the excitement. Uh, that's where I noticed a few more cameras in our group. I noticed a few more people, and uh, I felt the energy. At a time when all around was struggling, Mickelson excelled. With his fifth birdie of the day, the Claret Jug was within touching distance. It was now clear the championship was his to lose. For Scott, the Lytham nightmare was cruelly reoccurring. In those testing holes, a small mistake can easily lead to bogeys, and 15 was inexcusable, really. That was um, pathetic. 
he trudged off the 15th green, dumbstruck. It's amazing how in 30 minutes you can go from leading to actually not even having a chance. But Mickelson still had the 18th to play and knew from bitter personal experience that nothing could be taken for granted. That was the Wingfoot moment. He could lose it here. He could get wild. He could have a moment of doubt or a moment of panic, and it was going to mean so much to him to win. I wondered if he was going to be able to handle it. Mickelson once double bogeyed the closing hole to lose the US Open by a single stroke. But here, his tee shot was flawless. It was just a beautiful thing to see. We all hope for it in our own lives. Will we be at our best when it matters most? And he was, at an age when you don't expect it. So it was just a perfect poetic ending, and I doubt he'll ever have a better moment in his career. Even so, Stenson wasn't giving in, as he gave himself a chance of birdie on 17 to keep his hopes alive. But up ahead, years of practice, fierce desire, and the heart of a great champion converged. I, I hit the shot on 18, dead perfect. It needed to either kick straight or fractionally right, and it did. People in Scotland really appreciate great golf. They just treat their champion so well. And walking up with that ball so close, knowing that I'm going to be able to two putt and I could really enjoy that moment. It was the greatest walk. I would get emotional just talking about it. I mean, it was something I'll never forget. Um, you almost wish you could just put the bag down and sit on it for a minute. It was by far the best round I've ever played. But when that putt went in, I, I knew it was over. Yeah! At the age of 43, in his 20th appearance at the sport's oldest major, Phil Mickelson was Open champion. I remember saying to Bones after I knocked it in and gave him a hug, I just said I did it. And I think we both were in a little bit of disbelief. We heard the roar on the last, and I said, said to Gareth, if, if I make this one, the hole in one might be a little bit too much to ask for coming up 18. By birding the 17th, Stenson tightened his grip on second place, leaving Westwood the only player capable of spoiling Mickelson's party. To do that, he would have to birdie the 15th. I felt like the championship had gone then, yeah. I knew that I needed to birdie the last three holes, which was always going to be pretty tough. Westwood was stoic, but were there any regrets? No, nope. don't ever do them. Pointless. Waste of time. You get what you deserve in life, don't you? Didn't hit the right shots at the right time. The Mickelsons could begin to celebrate. Having Amy and the kids there was a, a, a moment that, that I'll cherish forever. Giving them a hug a, after the round. It was just a moment I'll cherish the rest of my life. You did awesome. It's the best I have, that was one. <laughs> <laughs> Your best is really good. For the second year in succession, Scott had missed another rich opportunity, but he birded the last to tie Westwood and Poulter for third. I never thought I'd have the game or the chance to win the Open, but I showed myself again this year, so it might be an ongoing affinity now with the Open, but I really feel like there is a claret jug in my future. Unable to recover from his poor start, Tiger shared sixth but the claret jug would be crossing the Atlantic. Mickelson, five shots behind at the start of the day, one by three. And ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the gold medal and the champion golfer of the year is Phil Mickelson.
There's something about this golf course that manages to identify a strong champion. And uh, goodness me, it's, it's done it again. It was great holding the jug, seeing the names on it, being included with the names on it, and this great, rich history of the game of golf. It's awesome. I said it well before ever winning this tournament, that if I was ever able to win the Open Championship, it would be the greatest accomplishment of my career. I didn't realize how big and important and amazing the Open Championship is until the guy at Caddy for won the tournament.